Um, so thank you, everyone. On behalf of the sponsoring organizations, we appreciate everybody come out. The um, Federal Bar Association, Federal Circuit Bar Association, Stanford Law School, um, Berkeley Law School, and Santa Clara Law School have combined for this effort. Um, and uh, you know, those organizations, many of you have relationships with them. They're fantastic, um, and they allow things like this to happen. So don't take them for granted. Uh, and with that, um, I'd like to introduce Judge Graywall, who's played a major role in organizing this conference. And um, uh, we were going to start with welcoming remarks from Judge Hamilton. She got caught in the uh, infamous Bay Area <laughs> traffic jam on Dumbarton Bridge and so forth. So we're going to have to do that later. I don't know, Paul, if you want to introduce um, uh, yourself and go from there. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with so many uh, friends, former colleagues, current opposing counsel, <laughs> and the like. <laughs> Welcome to you all. Uh, as, we, as you all know, we're here to honor Judge Ron White, and we're going to be talking a lot more about Judge White, obviously, over the next several hours. But what we're really here to do in honor of Judge White is to talk a little bit of patent law, which I think is, in many ways, the perfect way to honor his decades of service to the Northern District and to this legal community. Um, you're going to hear a bit more from me and from Judge White at lunch when we have our interview as, as people take their food. But in the meantime, we're going to kick things off with our panel and our uh, panel of academics to start. Uh, Mark, I'll let you introduce your colleagues, but I'll just briefly introduce Professor Mark Lemley, who needs no introduction to this crowd. Uh, Mark, of course, is not only a professor here at Stanford Law School, but also partner with the Dury Tangri firm. Mark, take it away. All right. Thanks, Judge Graywell. Um, well, we're very happy to be here. Um, uh, I have uh, uh, my colleagues here um, from various Bay Area uh, schools uh, who are leading lights in their own right in intellectual property law. Uh, and internet law, uh, Eric Goldman from Santa Clara University, uh, Peter Manel from Berkeley, and Rob Murgis from Berkeley. Um, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about Judge White's contributions to IP law. Uh, we've gone a little more broader than patent law. Um, and uh, and uh, to start that off, I did a little bit of uh, uh, statistical digging, because that's what I do. Um, and uh, Judge White took the bench in 1992. Um, one or two things have changed in IP law since 1992. Uh, we created a little process called Markman, for instance. Um, uh, we used to grant injunctions on a regular basis back in 1992. Um, uh, it was unclear in 1992 whether we uh, would allow patenting of software, so I guess what <laughs> we could say that is it changed and then changed back and maybe changed again. Um, uh, but the process of, uh, of uh, change in intellectual property law um, uh, was one that, uh, uh, that Judge White was really in very important respects at the heart of. Uh, and that was brought home to me uh, when I uh, did some research and uh, uh, took a brief look at the 410 opinions he has written in intellectual property and internet law since 1992. Um, and a couple of things stood out for me when I uh, uh, glanced through the list of the 410 opinions. Uh, the first was a, a personal walk through memory lane. Uh, a, a decent number of those older cases sort of reprised my history as a, as a lawyer uh, uh, through the 1990s and the 2000s. I saw a number of cases that I had worked on, that my firm had worked on, uh, including the very first uh, case uh, uh, I argued in federal court, uh, which was a, 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 a demurrer, or a motion to dismiss in, uh, on a, a counter, on a, um, a declaratory judgment for invalidity. Uh, I was a first year associate and I got sent in uh, uh, to defend the idea that we didn't actually have to tell you why the patent was invalid. It was enough to say 102, 103, and 112, um, uh, and we could go home. Uh, Judge White said, I don't think so, come back with more. Uh, that turned out, I think, at the time to be a controversial idea and one the Federal Circuit hadn't really endorsed, but which I think, at least as of 2016, is uh, the right answer. Um, and one that we will uh, see, uh, one, one that we'll see implemented in the case law in the future. 
I also saw a large number of cases whose names will be familiar to you, uh, cases that you're going to hear a little more detail about, uh, uh, like Religious Technology Center versus Netcom, uh, like eBay versus Bitter's Edge, uh, which set fundamental principles of internet law and copyright law at a time when uh, the application of uh, the rules on the internet was really up in the air. Uh, cases like Xilinx versus Altera and Rambus versus Hynix, which made fundamental uh, uh, principles of patent law uh, uh, set precedent that uh, we've been using ever since, and cases uh, uh, that involve companies uh, that we all uh, know, uh, Sun versus Microsoft, which we'll hear a little bit more about, Google versus Microsoft, uh, and the uh, trade secrets and uh, non-compete question of whether California or Washington state law should apply, uh, and uh, and also cases that, uh, while they involve household names, might not involve household names in the, in the sense that you would uh, necessarily think of them. Uh, one of his most recent opinions is in a case called Theta Chi versus Stanford, uh, which involves the question of whether uh, the national Theta Chi fraternity um, can bring suit against Stanford University because there's a group uh, at Stanford University that calls itself Theta Chi that is not affiliated with the national Theta Chi University. Um, and uh, Judge White throughout has has been, I think, instrumental in the development, not just of patent law, but of all kinds of intellectual property and internet law through the case law uh, that he has uh, written. But he's also been instrumental in other respects. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about is Judge White's role in the development of patent law, not just on the bench, but off the bench. Uh, he has been a driving force in judicial education around patent law with the Federal Judicial Center. He has been the driving force in developing uh, model patent rules uh, in this district, uh, model patent jury instructions in this district, and those in turn have served as a, as a template that the rest of the country has increasingly used. Uh, and he's also been a presence at um, uh, conferences at programs, uh, thinking deeply about uh, about patent law issues, uh, and often asking questions that none of us have really even yet managed to figure out the answer. Uh, I remember a number of panels I served uh, with Judge White on in which he brought a piece of paper that he had folded into a sort of square uh, cupping, uh, cupped mechanism, uh, and he would hold up his piece of folded piece of paper and say, uh, I want to know whether this piece of paper is bowl-shaped. The claim says bowl-shaped. Tell me whether this is a bowl-shaped piece of paper. How do I figure out whether it's a bowl-shaped piece of paper? As far as I know, Judge, we don't actually know uh, for certain whether it is or is not a bowl-shaped piece of paper. Um, um, but we also don't really know, even yet, who's supposed to decide whether it's a bowl-shaped piece of paper, which was one of his points in giving the example. Is this a question of claim construction? It depends on what bowl-shaped mean. Is it a question of fact? We know what a bowl is, and the question is, is this sufficiently similar to a bowl? The Federal Circuit is still struggling with that issue in a number of cases in the last year or two. Um, and we also don't really know, uh, I think, uh, if we decide it is a question of claim construction, how it is that we, uh, what, what sources of information we need to turn to to resolve that issue. Uh, uh, Judge White once famously said on one of these panels uh, that under the Markman proceeding, uh, the important thing was not what sources you consulted, but whether you got the right answer, whether the Federal Circuit at the end of the day agreed with your answer. Uh, and what he said was, I can consult a Ouija board if I want to, as long as the answer I get is the answer that the Federal Circuit thinks is the right answer. Um, because if we think it really is a question of law, not a question of fact, um, uh, we ought to care only about sort of the ultimate uh, uh, result. What is the scope of the patent? Uh, I think there's some reason to think we care at least sometimes about the interpretive process and the information that we, uh, that we look to. Uh, but Judge White, I think, both on the bench and off the bench, asked fundamental hard questions that lawyers, that judges, that scholars are still struggling with uh, that go to the heart of the, of the patent litigation enterprise, that go to the heart of the question of what it is that we are doing um, 
And, and the result, I think, of asking those questions, the result of his uh, uh, trying to help us figure out the answers to those questions, not just on the bench, but in writing jury instructions in plain English that jurors could understand, uh, has been a really enduring legacy uh, uh, that we are all very grateful to have. Uh, so I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Eric Goldman, who's going to talk about some of the uh, cases that uh, uh, Judge White has decided in, in some more detail. You're not turning over uh, I wasn't going to turn it over to you, but I can turn it over to Rob first yeah, if you'd like. Happy to. All right, uh, welcome. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm a last minute substitute for uh, Colleen Chen, and I'm delighted to be a part of this conversation. And for me, I get a chance to shine a little bit of light on uh, Judge White's uh, internet law jurisprudence, um, which in this crowd might get a little bit overshadowed by all of his contributions in patent law, uh, but certainly it's got, not gone unnoticed in the internet law community. Um, I noticed when I was looking through the 410 cases that Mark referenced, um, at least uh, two of the internet law cases have become uh, regular contributions to internet law casebooks, the Religious Technology Centers versus Netcom case and the eBay versus Bitter's Edge case. And I was trying to think about why, and I think that um, there were certain hallmarks of the cases that, um, that stood out. They were well-researched and cited, um, they were succinct, they were clear and they were important. And I think that uh, those traits are likely to come up in a lot of our discussions today. Um, what I wanted to do was just make three uh, um, uh, brief points about the internet law contributions that Judge White has made. Um, obviously he, I'll start with the first, which is obviously he had the uh, opportunity or benefit of being a federal judge in the Silicon Valley during the dot-com boom. And, for those of you who remember the 1990s and the internet mania that took place here, um, obviously that created a steady stream of cases that ended up on Judge White's docket. Um, uh, the docket contains all the big power institutions here in the Silicon Valley. I noticed, for example, for some reason, eBay seemed to be a frequent customer. Um, but um, also we had some of the uh, big clash of the titans Silicon Valley cases that showed up on uh, Judge White's docket, cases like uh, the uh, Cadence versus Avant case, a trade secret case that um, uh, basically uh, was almost too uh, difficult to believe that an entire big public company was founded on the theft of its um, former employer's trade secrets and that turned out to be the case. Or the uh, uh, Sun versus Microsoft case that, uh, that Mark mentioned, which um, uh, was Google versus, uh, I'm sorry, Oracle versus Google in the 1990s. Um, uh, basically involved uh, the questions about uh, when something could be advertised as Java compliant. Um, and uh, just by virtue of the steady stream of cases involving the key Silicon Valley players working on internet related uh, matters, um, that alone gave uh, Judge White an outsized uh, influence on the development of internet law um, across uh, the country. Um, th another thing that stood out in reviewing the cases was uh, Judge White's demonstrated uh, comfort with internet technologies at their earliest stages. Um, so some of the cases that uh, really stood out to me included cases like, what does it mean to distribute content by Usenet? Asked in 1995. Um, and I bet many of us couldn't even answer the question today. Um, certainly then, that was a hard question to answer. Uh, what does it mean to send online robots and to use proxy servers back in 2000? Um, or what does it mean to operate a virtual world in 2008? Um, the, the patent cases obviously have a lot of technological complexity based into them, but I think the internet law cases uh, sometimes give uh, the patent cases a run for their money in terms of their technological complexity. And it seemed to me that Judge White's comfort and experience with the patent law jurisprudence often uh, helped him sort through the technological challenges of the cases that he was seeing. Um, the third uh, theme that came out of the case, um, cases that I reviewed uh, was his lasting contributions to the age-old metaphysical question, what makes the internet unique, special, or different compared to the offline world or to other media? Um, this is the uh, internet law 101 question. Uh, we asked this in the beginning of our class and we keep talking about it all semester. And Several of the cases actually gave us some really useful insights and opportunities to think about that. Um, 
So for example, in 2000, um, Judge White had the, opinion, uh, the opportunity to opine on how having 100,000 people standing in a retail store was different than send, making 100,000 queries of a web server. Um, what is the technological properties of having 100,000 people in a store and how that might look different from uh, interacting with a web server. In 2008, he had the opportunity to opine upon how a virtual town uh, is different than a company town for First Amendment purposes. We might see virtual streets and we might see virtual sidewalks and virtual parks, but it's still not a company town the way that we think about it under the jurisprudence. And then we're going to talk in uh, more detail about the RTC versus Netcom case, but in 1995, Judge White was wrestling with the questions like, is reading a book different from browsing content online? The answer, of course, is yes. There's a whole copyright overlay to the online reading that isn't present in the offline reading. Or whether or not an internet access provider qualifies as a, quote, common carrier, which is, of course, is a statutory construction term. And uh, some people have argued we should interpret it more broadly. And Judge White had the, the simple answer, no, the statute tells us what a common carrier is. Um, or whether or not an internet access provider acts as the functional equivalent of a photocopier. Um, is it a machine that people just press the button um, and make their own copies? And in, in the RTC versus Netcom case, he said it was. Um, and I think the thing that stood out um, in this question about the metaphysical question, what makes the internet need special difference, is that it was clear to Judge White as early as 1995 how important the law was going to be to whether or not the internet could even exist. And so in the case, his ruling included the statements that he was uncomfortable with holding uh, uh, web servers liable for processing third-party content um, because it would lead to unreasonable and workable outcomes. Basically, his perspective was um, that setting up and operating uh, a system that is necessary for the function of the internet um, shouldn't be uh, uh, the basis of liability. If it is, we would have no internet. And uh, we can thank Judge White for recognizing that back in 1995 and 2016. I think many of us love the internet and we'd be pretty bummed if we had reached a different conclusion. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time, Mark, but um, uh, I'm gonna just say a few more words about the Netcom case. And I think uh, uh, Peter's got some other words he wants to add about this. Um, it, it's, in some ways, a, uh, from an internet law perspective, the defining case for Judge White's jurisprudence, it, it was that important and had that much implications. Um, some of you may remember the case, a very technologically complex case. We've got a uh, former Church of Scientologist who has his in his possession some of the uh, religious texts. He's distributing copies of these texts via Usenet a globally distributed network of communication, um, and they had topical themes, including a themed topic for Scientology discussion. So the uh, gentleman uploads a copy of these religious tests through his bulletin board service. You guys remember those? Um, and the bulletin board service has digital connections to uh, an, a Usenet service provider. That was Netcom. And then Netcom has digital connections to the rest of the internet that allows the Usenet groups to talk with all of each other. Um, and so you've got all these players in the system that need to be analyzed separately. The person who uploaded the file, the, uh, the bulletin board service that was connected to that person, the Usenet service provider connected to the bulletin board service, the rest of the internet, and then every other person who was reading this file on uh, uh, Usenet who was being able to download or access that file. Um, even today, I think, if we were presented with a case of that kind of technological complexity, some of us would feel uncomfortable about trying to parse through all the different layers and sets of responsibilities. Um, and so the opinion actually starts out that this is an, in, in your typical gentle Judge uh, White nomenclature, this is an issue of first impression. Uh, yes, it was. Um, <laughs> Um, and some of you may remember this case as a, defense, as a defense win, and it certainly held up as that, but if you read the case over again, you'll see it was a much more nuanced ruling. There were a lot of things in there that, that didn't go the way of the defendants, um, but the defense win part was so important because of its implications. Let me just say a few words about that. 
Um, this case uh, articulated all the following types of doctrines that we now take for granted, that there is a volitional or causation defense to copyright infringement, um, that internet access providers aren't liable, I'm sorry, directly liable for copyright infringement, now codified in 17 U.S.C. 512A, um, that contributory copyright infringement requires particularized knowledge, um, which has turned into the notice and takedown scheme for liability of web hosts, which is now codified in 17 U.S.C. 512C. Judge White wrote that a copyright holder's failure to provide the necessary documentation to show that there is likely infringement was a problem for the plaintiff's case. And this is a really radical concept, a concept that um, people, I think, are still grappling with, the idea that the copyright owner had an affirmative duty to take some steps before they would actually be ready to bring their copyright case. Um, certainly we have some formality in copyright law, but this burden on, on going and doing some pre-enforcement work before you could go into court to enforce it was really, I think, quite radical. Um, other things from this case, it established that, that web browsing was likely fair use, that um, uh, uh, web hosts may need to consider um, fair uses in their consideration whether to remove um, uh, content now codified in 17 U.S.C. 512F, and finally, um, what types of injunctions would be appropriate in cases like this, now codified in 17 U.S.C. Uh, 512J. Um, and the reason why this case stands out to me so much is because this district court case proved to be so influential in the policy circles that it became the template for the DMCA. I just gave you a reference of all these different statutory sections that derive their inspiration from this case. The DMCA, in turn, proved to be the foundation for the EU e-commerce directive, which uh, then became the governing law in all of Europe. Um, so this district court opinion became not only the template for the national policy, but a global policy as well. Um, and we just don't see many district court cases that have those implications. So, uh, Peter, you want to say something about RTC versus Netcom? Uh, I'm going to work it in, but I have a somewhat different approach to this go for uh, it. responsibility. So, uh, Judge White, it's such a pleasure to be here and an honor to honor you. Uh, I thought I would reverse the way I usually communicate with you where, where I'm writing a recommendation letter for one of my students to serve as one of your clerks. So I thought I would script a, a recommendation letter for you. Uh, I might be going out on a limb here, but it would begin like this. Dear President Clinton, uh, you will soon have some slots to fill on a very important court, and I know a great candidate. Uh, I know he's maybe looking to retire, and this is one of those unique opportunities. He obviously uh, is ready for the job, and what I would put in my recommendation is, first of all, he was a litigator's judge. Here was a judge who understood the lay of every case that came before him. He thought about what was going on with the parties, but he thought about the bigger picture. As Eric has suggested, uh, Judge White was someone who cared about the long term, how cases affect many parties and the national policies, uh, but in the context of resolving a case. And that led him, even though he was not himself a patent litigator, to create really the foundational rules by which almost all patent litigation is handled. So in addition to the substantive law of the internet, we have a jurist who's thinking about the practicalities of moving cases through an adjudicatory system in a very balanced and fair way. And the litigators came to embrace what Judge White began. And when you go back and look at some of that early history, this was just the, the original patent local rules were intended as as a guidance, it wasn't going to be mandated, but the litigators ended up wanting to do it. And even when it wasn't required of them, they decided this will save everyone a lot of time and money to get the case figured out. So we've got the best of the litigator judge, but he was also the judge's judge. Uh, he was the mentor to many, many judges. Uh, and I, I don't see him here today, but I know someone who would want to be here is Judge Fogel. And whenever I would invite Judge Fogel to come and speak at a program, he would say, well, did you ask Ron first? Because 
because that's who I would bring in to, uh, to, to, to address those questions. But it, it goes well beyond that. The opinions themselves are so thoughtful. They're really written for other judges and for academics uh, as well. Uh, they try to provide the richness that you need to understand why this particular litigation is there, but then how we're going to deal with these issues of first impression. Because even beyond the fact that Judge White was always dealing with cutting edge technologies, which brings new questions, he was dealing with what we in the academy call common law statutes. Copyright and patent are statutes that date back to 1790. Most of these statutes have been fleshed out by judges. Even the Copyright Act, which is massive today, has vast areas of jurisprudence, of common law jurisprudence, the, the volition, those kinds of issues are judge made. In fact, there is no substantial similarity of protected expression in any statute I've seen. There's no doctrine of equivalence. And all along the way, Judge White was using that sort of common law sensibility and that produced these beautiful opinions that, you know, it's very rare for district court opinions to make it into case books. It's not that we discriminate against them, it's just that that it's usually the circuit law or the Supreme Court law that's going to set the standards, but that was not true of Judge White's opinions. They, they did make it into our case books, and I think that really uh, speaks to this third part of my recommendation, which is, which frankly I don't think President Clinton will care about, but he was an academics judge, and I mean that in several senses. First and foremost for me is his mentorship, mentorship of academics. And uh, I can speak to this very directly. Uh, when Rob and I started the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology, we had to come up with what a Center for Law and Technology was. And I wrote naively to the Federal Judicial Center and proposed that we could host an education program for them. I got a call the next week saying, and this was right during the dot-com bubble era, that, well, we actually need help educating judges. So we're gonna be sending you 35 or 40 judges in a few months, please get them educated. Uh, and uh, that put me on the spot because I frankly had not been a litigator. Uh, my scholarship was limited to areas that I had you know, chosen and yet we were gonna have 35 to 40 federal judges soon upon us. And, and people told me about Judge White, I call, invited him to participate and uh, I would say he and Judge Ellis from the Eastern District of Virginia, they taught me how to build that program. And it was a fabulous program. It was right around when the Markman cases were you know, beginning. We had the patent local rules and it became an annual event. I'm now planning the 20th edition of this event. And at this point, I actually know a little about what we're gonna cover. But uh, I do remember Judge White, and, and he was very gentle in the way he handled it. I mean, he didn't say, you don't know that? Uh, <laughs> he would just say, okay, we'll take this one step at a time. And uh, it was the best reviewed program that the FJC had ever done. And they called us up and said, we're doing it again next year, and it's been 20 years, and I can't thank him enough. And in fact, I see Judge Michelle here, who was really, in some ways, he planted the seeds for the Markman case law. He wrote articles saying, we have to get this question confronted. Uh, and then he later involved me in other things that I didn't know about, like the ITC. But we'll leave that for another day when we're celebrating uh, Judge Judge Michelle, but, but Judge White has always, I think, taken the time and care, and I hear this back from those students that I did recommend to him, uh, how, how phenomenal the clerkship experience was. I don't know if clerks are gonna be on the panels today, but I, but I can report that, that they all speak of that year as, as this, the best year of their career, and I, th I think that's part of, of who we're talking about. Fortunately, because we've been doing this for so many years, these patent local rules and the jury instructions have now been codified, uh, and again, I thank Judge White as, as my advisor and mentor, in the Patent Case Management Judicial Guide, which is now in its third edition. It's very widely used, and I think has taken us from a point in which judges really existed in silos. Uh, if you were to go around to the different patent jurisdictions, the different jurisdictions, you would find that most judges were making it up uh, without really much consultation. Uh, patent law was, was really inchoate at that point. 
And uh, I think the combination of the Federal Circuit and Judge White, really, he was at that level in terms of how he was able to, to spread ideas throughout this, uh, throughout the country. Uh, now we have a very detailed set of rules. I see Judge Stark here. I know he was another great student of Judge White. And, you know, I was essentially taking the gospel from Judge White and spreading it to the Judge Stark. So, so it is just a wonderful uh, moment for, for those of us who, who would like to be able to repay or at least to recognize uh, Judge White's contributions. And I do think that, that Judge White is the, is the, uh, the model for judges in our culture. Rob? Okay, I'm gonna use the left card if I can. <clears throat> well, I knew this was gonna happen, so I prepared for it. I knew these guys were gonna talk all substance because there's so much to talk about with Judge White. So I thought I would do something a little bit different. Um, what I wanted to talk about was why it is that not only do we uh, honor and respect Judge White so much for his substantive knowledge, but also why we think of him as such a model judge. And it got me thinking, you know, what is it about the way he goes about his work that is so exemplary? And that got me onto this topic. So my, my title is borrowed from the Divine Comedy. In one of the passages in the Divine Comedy, Dante talks about a, uh, a, a, a forerunner, uh, an antecedent poet uh, named Arno Daniel. And he calls him in Italian, il miglior fabro, which means the greater craftsperson, the greater craftsman. And that's how I really think of Judge White. He's a really, really fine craft person. Not only did he know the law really well, but the way he did it, and the way he went about his business, I think, was exemplary. And that's what I want to talk about. Uh, that same uh, phrase was picked up by T.S. Eliot, and uh, this is the first time I saw it, in the dedication to Eliot's long epic poem, The Wasteland, he dedicated to, to Ezra Pound, um, borrowing the phrase. So it has a kind of uh, literary background, but I want to apply it to, to Judge White's work uh, in this little talk here. So why do we come together and celebrate an exemplary judge? Well, to show appreciation for expertise, of course. And that's what this fine panel has done, right? And I knew that these, these folks could do, uh, would do that. And I could go on, believe me, I, I'm, I'm uh, thrilled to go on about the details, especially of patent law. You want to talk about secondary considerations or obviousness type double patenting, I'm your guy, right? I love that stuff. But I knew that these guys would cover some of that ground. And so uh, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the second point, which is to call attention to Judge White as an example. And I was thinking about what, what, how, do you, how do you formulate that? How do you get your arms around that? What do you mean? There's a lot of judges who know the law, right? Uh, the vast majority really know what they're doing. But why is it that some judges have that something extra that adds that extra layer of respect? Where you might say, I'm happy to you know, give my Sunday school class to this judge and let him take care of him. Or if we had a picnic and we're trying to decide who's going to be the umpire and we have all these... Uh, highly competitive people, you know, in this community, we might converge on Judge White and say, well, you be the umpire, right? Unless he wants to pitch or, or be the designated hitter, then we'll let him do that. The point is there are qualities and characteristics beyond substantive knowledge that Judge White embodies, and that's really what I wanted to get at. So I have a colleague at Georgetown, uh, Larry Solom, who actually uh, uh, has written about this, and he talks about the virtues of a good judge in a kind of systematic way, the way that, that philosophers do. Um, and he lays out these four virtues as paradigmatic of, of what a good judge is all about. Number one is courage. Number two is temperament. Three is intelligence or, or just kind of raw processing power, right? And the fourth, and of course the hardest to get hold of sometimes, is wisdom. So I'm just going to go through these. Uh, exemplifying courage is a case outside of our main topic, right? We're here to talk about IP, but Judge White decided a First Amendment case shortly after 9-11. And in this case, some protesters had been putting up kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, peace-oriented signs that were then taken down by, I think it was the uh, 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 Caltrans. 
And um, at the same time, uh, these protesters noted that no one was taking down the American flags that had been placed on these highway overpasses. And so the argument was made, gee, this looks like a First Amendment violation, right? And Caltrans, in the spirit of the time, you remember how traumatic it was, tried to defend the flag as being different. They tried to justify it as being different from the protest signs, right? Uh, and yet, in the shadow of this big national cataclysm where patriotism was at this really kind of very, very high watermark, Judge White wrote a very calm, reasoned opinion saying, I really don't see the difference between the flag and the protest sign, and I'm afraid we're going to have to apply the law equally to both, right? That takes a little bit of courage in the shadow of a big national event. Um, it has the flavor of a dissent, you know, from the Japanese internment cases. It has the flavor of somebody who has the long view. It has the flavor of somebody who has some courage. Uh, the second would be temperament, and the best way to get a feel for this is to not read the big $100 million cases, right? Not read the important cases, not read the trend-setting cases. Judge White has plenty of those to his credit. The way you can tell a craftsperson, right, is to look at their work when nobody is watching them. Look at the unimportant cases, the cases about the little guy, the cases most people will never read. And so I just pilled a couple. He has some where people are accused of being uh, vexatious litigants, and he gives them their due, and is very careful in applying that label, right? Even though they seem like gadflies, and everyone seems to be annoyed by them, Judge White gives them their due. Uh, I was impressed with a lengthy and detailed and serious opinion in a tax rebate case worth all of $11,000, where the, 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 the taxpayer argued pro se. And Judge White marched through the tax code and the IRS regulations as carefully as he would Section 103 or Section 112 in a hundred or three hundred million dollar patent case, right? That opinion is just as careful, it is just as serious, it is just as well cited, and it gives that taxpayer the same dignity as the losing party in a five hundred million dollar patent case. That's impressive to me. Same with securities class actions, where you know this complaint has got to be bounced. It's based on some crazy theory about a drop in the stock price. But he goes through the law carefully, and he applies it, and gives the plaintiffs their day in court, as is their right, under securities law, right? Same with prisoner appeals. Here's somebody who is incarcerated, has plenty of time, classic jailhouse lawyer, and when you read through it, Judge White gives that inmate the same dignity he would give one of us, a member of the bar, cites the cases, carefully walks through, and that inmate may be disappointed, but he won't feel that he didn't get his day in court. He will feel that he had the full attention and interest and respect of a federal court judge, and that is all we can ask, right? So these are cases where really nobody's looking, and they're careful, and they're serious. Okay, intelligence and reason. Here's one that I like from the Hynix case, one of many, many points you can draw on from that case. So the, uh, uh, the plaintiff tried to make an argument, uh, and if the lawyer is here, this is no, no knock on you, I might have tried it myself. <laughs> uh, they tried to make an argument sort of from inference that there had been copying in this case, and their, their case was what, let's call it circumstantial. They said there are thousands of features in this uh, uh, complex uh, uh, integrated circuit, and how could it possibly be, right, that the infringer's product is identical to ours with respect to 2,000 features. And so they said, when you multiply these, these you know, 2,000 independent decisions together, there's a very, very low probability, right, that this thing was independently created. Well, that's not a horrible argument, but I wouldn't try it on a math major from Wesleyan, right? <laughs> Which is what we're talking about here. Judge White pretty quickly knocks that down and say, well, many of the sub-features are dependent on the major features. And so there may have been a handful of decisions that were made, and many of these sub-features follow from that, so get out of here, in a respectful way. Uh, don't try that on me, is basically uh, what he says. Uh, in another, in another uh, a component of that case, uh, Judge White is talking about uh, an argument on whether the case is uh, exceptional or not, and um, 
<clears throat> he says, well, this was long, and it was worth a lot of money, and the parties fought like hell. Uh, but of course, in the patent context, that's not particularly exceptional. It may be in the colloquial sense, but not around here. Uh, and so I thought that was a good sort of application of common sense, which uh, uh, moves us to our next topic, uh, which is wisdom. Now, when you, when you are trying to, to assess the quality of a, a district court judge, you know, one way, of course, is to read through the opinions, which, which my panel, fellow panelists have done. Another way is to see what the courts of appeals say, see what they have to say, because they review district court opinions. That's what they do, right? Over and over in uh, appeals from um, a Judge White's court, you see the phrases, uh, he ruled correctly, he properly applied the law, didn't abuse his discretion, um, et cetera, and so on. So looking at the appellate record is a good way, I think, to get a sense uh, of, of uh, how much the courts respect the judge. And then there was this one I like from the, a Nokia case a couple years ago uh, where uh, the plaintiff tried to argue that Judge White didn't know that intent was not an element of patent infringement, and the Federal Circuit said, are you kidding? <laughs> Uh, this is Judge White we're talking about. He didn't do any such thing. And that's what we mean when we talk about that sort of uh, quality that goes beyond just substantive knowledge, right? So if I were to, to summarize, what I would say is that when I travel abroad and, and, and people from other countries want to know what is it about the U.S. judicial system, what is it about these judges that <laughs> command so much respect? Because in lots of countries, um, they're, they're well-respected civil servants, and they have a, a high stature in society, but there's not always that same something else, right? Uh, and what I would tell people is, it's because of judges like Judge White, who not only know what they're doing and have the respect for their substantive knowledge, but the way they do their work, the way that he executes his craft, that is worthy of even a higher level of respect, right? So it really, as Peter said, it's an honor to be on a panel that gets to honor Judge White. That's a real highlight for me because he's the kind of judge that I think of as truly exemplary and the kind of person who sets a standard not only for other judges but for all of us in pretty much anything we do. So my hat's off and I have exhausted my supply of Italian phrases, so I will say thank you very much. So we have a little bit of time if either other panelists want to uh, say anything else or, or if folks from the audience um, have, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure questions fits obviously, but um, uh, reminiscences about their favorite uh, IP case uh, from Judge White. I will note one thing in the, in the interim when I went through the 410 cases in Westlaw, one thing that struck me, you know, not immediately, but sort of maybe a third of the way through, and then I started looking for it, and it turned out to be true, is that Westlaw red flag, right? No longer good law. Few and far between in Judge White's cases, which is, I think, particularly remarkable in a, in a time of enormous ferment in patent law when the Markman rules have been changed, uh, when uh, district judges were complaining about 50% reversal rates on Markman. Uh, you know, there were a few red flags, but there were maybe 20 out of 410 uh, opinions, and that's really quite remarkable. Um, and I think it is a indication of what Rob's just told us. Judge Guilford. question, was Peter's recommendation to the Federal Circuit or the Supreme Court? <laughs> well, he did say a, a really important court. Uh, Peter, you want to? <laughs> I'm going to the Supreme Court. <laughs> All right, anyone? Ed, you want to, should we call it? Yeah, why don't we transition? All right, great, thank you all. Mm -hmm.